uh, but you know the ten dollar word for it is paleolinology but basically uh, it's it's using the history that's at the bottom of lakes to reconstruct environmental change and lakes are quite wonderful first of all Canada has lots of lakes whenever I see a lake I see a time machine slowly 24 hours a day 365 days of the year sediment is accumulating at the bottom of the lake Sediment is coming from outside the lake basin, things like pollen grains, soil particles, chemical contaminants, slowly making their way into the lake. Also material within the lake. I'm a limnologist. I'm usually more interested in what's happening in the lake itself. Virtually everything living in that lake is leaving some sort of morphological or chemical fossil in the lake sediments. Every day, 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year, material is slowly accumulating at the bottom of the lake. That makes like a time machine. Uh, lakes around this part of the world in Ontario go back about 12,000 years till about the time of the Ice Age. That would be about, in typical Ontario Lake, be about three meters of sediment. In that sediment is a history book or a library of information that we can use to reconstruct how the lake has changed and also how the environment around it has changed. That is an important important record that we can use and our job as paleolimnologists is to interpret that record in a way that's meaningful to other scientists and the public at large. Of having, uh, like so a milk, uh, the surface sediments are about the consistency of a milkshake actually and if you have a milkshake in front of you in a straw and you put the straw into the milkshake and you put your thumb on top of the straw and you pull it up you can sort of take a core of your milkshake we're sort of doing about the same thing we're sending this down on a on a rope very carefully uh, once we're at the right level, we send a, a lead messenger. It's like putting your thumb on top of the straw, and we can pull up a history book. In this case, that'd be about 200 years of history in a typical Ontario lake. We have that history book. Uh, we have to section it. Here I'm sectioning it a quarter centimeter time. So it's, again, we have to push it from the bottom, and we carefully section it. Each of those little sections represents about two or three years of lake history. Every time I go back, I'm going back in time, back into the 1800s, 1700s, 2,000 years ago. Some lakes can go back millions of years. Now, if you look at that, it looks like mud, and, and it is mud. Uh, but in that mud is an incredible library of information. So far, all I've told you, we take a sediment core, and we look at the fossils. But I have to know where I am in the history book. Where is 1950? Where is 1850? Where is 2,000 years ago? So we have to date the sediments. Now, if we're going back thousands of years, we use radiocarbon or C14 dating, the same thing archaeologists use. But if you're going back only the last 200 years, the half-life is not good for that. We can't use radiocarbon dating for the last 200 years. So what we do is we use a different technique. It's called lead 210. It's another isotope. It has a half-life of 22 years. And we measure how much lead 210 is in the sediments. And then instead of just putting depth, this might originally have said zero centimeters to 50 centimeters. Now I'm not sure how well you see it, but now I can put, put dates on it. So for example, at the bottom of the core, it's, uh, it's about the 1840s. The top of the core is 2006 when we took the core. So I'm in Ottawa now, so I thought I'd put a Canadian context here. That's about the time of Sir John A. Macdonald over there. Uh, that's the last time the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup. <laughs> We shouldn't, I was going to put all the Canadian teams, they, they were all clustering around that time, so we shouldn't be <laughs> too smug. But we can also say when a mine opened, um, when agriculture started, we can actually put a timeline, not just a depth line. No. The Arctic is that? Okay. That's because the Arctic is the first to show signs of environmental change, climate change, and often to the greatest degree. And a lot of this, I'm sure you know this, but a lot of this is related to reflectivity, what we, have, what we talk. And the, 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 the north natural state of the Arctic is white, <laughs> ice and snow. Uh, and I use the analogy that if I went out on a hot August day uh, outside this building and there were two cars in the parking lot, one was a white car, one was a black car. If I put my hands on both cars, they'd both be hot, but the black car would be hotter. That's because the black car is absorbing heat and the white car is acting like a mirror, reflecting heat. The Arctic is its natural state is like the white car, reflecting heat. You start warming the planet with greenhouse gases, it's becoming more like the black car, and it heats up even more, heats up even more, it melts even more snow and ice, it heats up even more, and this is what we refer to as positive feedbacks, and this is why, one of the main reasons why the Arctic is so sensitive. Paper. But remember, 1994 was a little early to start talking about 
climate warming. It wasn't really on the radar screen. Uh, people said, yeah, it'll probably happen, but we were already saying in these highly sensitive sites, it's already happening, right? It's already happened, and it's continuing on. Uh, by the time 10 years later, we were at a conference, and by that point, a lot of other people were doing the same techniques we were doing, using all around the world. And so uh, we, we brought together all these scientists, it's 26 co-authors, and I'm thinking about writing a paper, about writing a paper with 26 co-authors, but that could be another Pagsy talk. Uh, but it's, it, it, was a, it was a fun but interesting thing. And we had, at that point, 55 profiles from across the circumpolar Arctic, all confirming that remarkable things are happening in the Arctic. So this has now become part of an international effort. Okay. So what? So does anyone care about how fossils have changed over the last 100 years in these sites? Well, we even predicted back in the 1990s, if this warming continues, remember these are shallow ponds, they're not thermocarst ponds, they're shallow ponds in granite. We said if this warming continues, this, basically the summer getting longer and longer and longer, eventually these shallow ponds will evaporate and disappear. We, we said that would happen. We never thought we'd see it in our lifetime. We actually did. So I'll just take to the second part of the story. Based on our data, our high Arctic ponds, were per, we knew they were permanent water bodies for thousands of years, but they started to change markedly over the last 100 years or so, consistent with climate warming. What's happened to these ponds over the last decade or so, the warmest decade on record? And this is where I think I get to some more of the depressing stuff. This is just one of our study ponds. This is a very small pond. Uh, this pond is, wouldn't even be the size of this room. Uh, there's, on the picture on the left is uh, a picture from July 1979. That's even before I was going to the Arctic. But we, a glaciologist happened to be on this study site, and he was taking pictures of the ice across the bay there, uh, and just happened to catch my pond. But you can see here in July 1979, a very nice pond. Here is a picture of me sampling in 1987, a, a younger, probably thinner John Small. Uh, and already at, you already see the winter snow it comes back in August. But still the pond is there, quite healthy, back in August. This is what the pond looks like now by July. Uh, the ponds are drying up, they're disappearing. They're, we're watching ecosystems disappear before our eyes. See this consistently now year after year. Uh, at the top, I have the last few hours of Camp Pond. It's been there for thousands of years. That puddle in the middle, the puddle in the middle is about the size of one of our breakfast tables here. I went and put a piece of white paper in that puddle or put my hand in. What you see there are all the little invertebrates, all the animals and plants that were in that pond, concentrating, concentrating, and about two o'clock in the morning, it went dry. 